So hello everyone and welcome to this Reform webinar on the future of post-Brexit regulation. So as we wait for everyone to kind of arrive, um, I thought that I would launch a little poll and get your opinions on a very important question. So I will be launching the poll now. I will allow panelists to vote as well. Um, so this is a kind of little Likert scale poll that you should be um, able to see on uh, your screen. So you basically have to select one option. Um, so I'm guessing some of you will um, be aware of the fact that yesterday the uh, MHRA published actually quite a lot of documents updating um, their guidance for post-Brexit regulation. Um, and actually now we know that basically from the 1st of July, 2023, new devices placed on the market in the UK will need to conform with a new type of kind of kite mark, which will be specifically the UKCA marking requirement. Um, and so the question to you um, as the audience is what do you think um, will be the impact of this? Do you think it will be kind of generally quite positive, mostly positive, neither positive or negative, mostly negative, very negative, or you're also allowed not to know. Um, so we have about 34% of the votes that have come in. So if you're just coming in now, you should normally see on your screen um, a little pop-up question. Um, so do cast your votes. I will wait till maybe about, I don't know, 60% of, of the vote is, is in as we still have kind of attendees um, coming in. So anyway, for those of you joining us uh, just now, a uh, very warm welcome to this reform webinar on the future of post-Brexit regulation. Um, we will be kicking off in a couple of minutes, just waiting for um, more attendees to come in through the platform. Um, and actually we might be waiting a, a tiny bit longer than we usually do, just because we have noticed that the Zoom platform for some reason, um, since they've had their worldwide bug, has actually become a bit slower <laughs> at letting uh, people through uh, when we did the testing. So we have about 73% of the vote that has come in. And it seems that up until now, people think that it will mostly have a negative impact on the innovation landscape, um, with about 26% of people um, who have voted, who express a kind of mostly negative sentiment towards um, that change. Um, but we also have about 23 that you know think it, it won't be either positive or negative. I can see a few more attendees have come through. You will see on your screen, there is a little question, uh, which is our kind of very first poll for um, today. So if you can just quickly cast your vote, I will just wait a couple of minutes for that, for those votes to come through. Um, and then I will kind of end the poll and share the results with you. Okay. Great, so we have about 71% of the votes that have come through. I will end the poll now and share the results uh, with you. So there we go. You should be able to see the results come up on your screen. Um, so actually a lot of people don't know <laughs> what the impact really uh, will be. And it seems to be, you know, kind of um, basically either for those who, who actually do have an opinion on, on the impact. It seems to be, you know, either neither positive nor negative or potentially mostly negative. So we will be talking um, a bit about um, a bit about that um, later on in the event. So you can see the results on your screen. Great. So I will now stop sharing those results um, and move away from the poll. Um, so great. So again. Welcome uh, everyone to this uh, webinar on the future of post-Brexit regulation. I'm Eleonora Harwich, Director of Research at Reform, and I will be chairing this webinar today. And I'm really delighted that we're having um, this discussion today as Reform has been very much involved with the debate around regulation and how to create um, a smarter regulatory process. And I'm also extremely excited because we're launching today a new publication which is a reformer thoughts looking at uh, the steps that the UK must take to deliver a kind of more dynamic and resp responsive um, regulatory system for both medicine and medical devices post Brexit. You can find a copy of this on our website, so please do have a look. It's also an extremely timely discussion um, as actually the medical devices bill is going through its second reading today in the House of Lords. 
Um, it's also a point in time where NICE is reviewing its health technology assessment methods. NHSX has also given funding to regulators to try and streamline a bit more the regulatory process. And it's also a point in time where the landscape is very rapidly evolving. As I mentioned um, at the very beginning of this event, the MHRA yesterday just released about 31 documents of updated guidance to post-Brexit regulation and related topics, which in all honesty, yesterday gave us a, a mini heart attack <laughs> as we were just about to uh, publish a reformer thoughts with a um, infographic about what we thought, uh, I guess that was the kind of potential direction of post-Brexit regulation, so we're now having to update that. Um, so you will be receiving a updated version of the Reformer Thoughts um, next week with a, with a, a kind of clarified um, infographic. Um, I guess some of the, the highlights of, of those changes is that obviously, as the poll indicated, the UK will have its own specific UKCE marking, uh, sorry, UKCA marking, gosh, Freud and slip there, uh, which will be the equivalent of the UK's kind of CE mark based on, on a standard which has a, a relatively unfortunate acronym of, of BS, but it stands for British standards. Um, and so some of these obviously are, are the topics that we will um, be exploring with the esteemed panel that I have with me today. So we have George Freeman uh, MP, who is a uh, former parliamentary under Secretary of State for Life Sciences. We have uh, Jean McHale, who is director of the Center for Health and Law Science and Policy at the University of Birmingham. And Emma Dufour, who is head of International Regulatory Policy and Intelligence at ABVI. They have actually all written a piece in the Reformer Thoughts, which um, is published today. So I do recommend, I cannot plug uh, this publication enough, do, do go on our website and uh, read it. So before handing over to panelists, I just thought um, I would go through some, a few logistical reminders. One is that we are actually recording uh, this event and it will be uh, available on our website and our YouTube channel shortly after this event. Also at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see both a, a chat function and a QA function. So the chat function, please feel free to use it if you want to share comments with panelists or other attendees. Do not use it to post questions as we, as we won't be monitoring it for questions, but do feel free to post your questions in the Q&A function as we will be closely uh, monitoring it. And finally, the hashtag for this event is hashtag post Brexit regulation. So please do feel free to tweet away. So I will now um, ask speakers to briefly introduce themselves and share with us uh, some of their wisdom on post Brexit regulation. And I will ask panelists to speak for about five minutes um, so that we can kind of quickly move on to the chaired discussion um, and Q&A with the audience. So George, if I could ask maybe if you could um, start. Brilliant, well, thanks Eleanor. And can I start by just thanking Reform for doing this because it's a crucial bit of work. I haven't read the whole report this morning, but it's very, very good and timely. And we are, you know, four months from leaving the European Union transitionary arrangements. And there's a lot of work to be done and this is important timely stuff. Um, look, just a very quick word of background in terms so I can explain where I'm coming from. And then I, I, I've got um, three points really I want to make about the, the challenge. Um, for those who, who don't know me, I was elected in 2010 after a 15 year career in the biomedical industry, basically five years in venture capital in the 90s, starting uh, drug discovery companies uh, at pace and we typically raised five million in the first three years and looked to float them. Then I was CEO of Amidas Pharmaceuticals, which was a predictive toxicology, AI software and silicon chemistry business that we sold to Takeda. And then um, slightly disillusioned with the VC model, uh, our last five years I set up and ran the UK's first translational medicine consultancy and we worked around the country putting together university industry and hospital partnerships. Um, elected 2010 and was lucky enough to be picked up by David Cameron and asked to help frame our first industrial strategy, the life science strategy, and then I became the minister for it, was responsible for NICE, the MHRA, the drugs budget. And in fact, we, we won a lot of plaudits internationally for creating that role and leaning in and creating a really bold 10-year strategy. And the, the central gist of that was that I... Um, uh, my advice to Prime Minister was that the UK life, well, the global life science 
uh, landscape was changing fast, uh, not just changing, was being massively disrupted, transformed by essentially genomics and informatics. And that the UK, which already was only clinging on by our fingertips, really, as both a market for medicines, we tend to be a low price and slow payer, which is a lethal combination. Uh, uh, we're already struggling to attract the necessary investment from companies here. We saw some closures. My argument was, um, we're going to have to lean in and really lead. And let's make a virtue of the NHS uh, and unleash a bold 10 year strategy to be a leader in genomics and informatics and really lead in the uh, genotypic and phenotypic profiling of patients and of new medicines so that we can offer industry the, the most precious gift of all, which is a place to come and do modern medicine development. Uh, and then that opens a whole door to a whole new model of reimbursement. Um, and so I, that's why I launched the Early Access to Medicine Scheme, the Accelerated Access Program. And if Brexit hadn't been interrupted, uh, David Cameron and I were planning to launch a whole series of uh, a new approach to digital health. I, I've always been skeptical that tipping four billion into the top of the NHS would create a digital NHS. And I think we should have take, done it by place and by disease. Uh, anyway, so that's the background. Uh, here are my, my points. The overarching point, I'm really worried that the prevailing approach to this issue of UK regul medicines regulation post-Brexit, it has been driven basically by damage limitation, risk minimization, and ensuring maximum continuity. Now, I understand that continuity in the short term immediately is key. It, you know, we, we absolutely don't want to disrupt short term. But I worry that I, the baby's been thrown out with the bathwater, that we're not looking enough at the the, the opportunities for us to really lead a new paradigm of regulation in this new landscape. And I think the, the focus, understandable focus on short term continuity has led us to not think enough about the possibilities for us to lead in this new landscape outside of the EU. Uh, I mean, I should stress to everyone, I was a very strong Remainer. Uh, I made a film about the UK life science industry as minister. I felt uh, I was speaking for the sector in being a strong Remainer. But once the people had spoken, I think we've got to make the best of it. And there are three specific things I just close in flagging. One, uh, on uh, genomics. I think we, we still tend to think too much of genomics as a, as a kind of um, a technological USP. Um, uh, and we're not harnessing it enough in the tr as a transformational tool in the profiling of medicines and uh, supporting a new paradigm for procurement. So I think if you ask the Department of Business, they'd say our ambition is to be a world leader in genomics, meaning we have a lot of people doing genomics here. But I don't think we're really yet using the power of that genomic insight to break down uh, and segment drug markets well enough to identify patients early enough and to drive new models of reimbursement. Potentially, we could be using our charitable sector to find patient groups and ask and invite them to lead accelerated access and to drive with their charities, drive new models of conditional approval uh, and payment by results. So that's the first point on genomics. Second point on digital. Uh, I think the digital health agenda has been driven too much by central NHS sort of cost accounting efficiency uh, approaches and not enough by the patient benefits of digital health. And I, I would, um, try and get away from the top down one digitalization strategy across the whole system and try and uh, support much more local place-based and disease-based approaches. So the ambition should be in three years that we've got uh, Man Greater Manchester, Greater Birmingham, Greater Oxfordshire, uh, London and Cambridge as five million patient digital communities that are actually doing patient engaged translational medicine and at the same time I'd maybe create three digital disease portals so as soon as you get a diagnosis you go straight onto a digital platform run by the charities so uh, and then third point um, I think we are in danger of uh, not thinking enough about uh, the new types of drugs and devices that are coming down the market and the convergence of digital and drug and device. And uh, I mean, the, the good news on this is the FDA have got a far bigger problem. When I went as minister to their campus, they got 
15,000 people in seven buildings, seven divisions. One is drugs, one is devices, one is digital. The truth is they're all beginning to merge much more closely. And I think that from a nice, an MHRA point of view, um, we're going to have to help them to modernize and lead in a new paradigm of regulation um, that is much quicker, much more fleet of foot and uh, less kind of um, universal and setting out universal rules that apply everywhere mm. and being a bit more flexible and a bit more international. And I'd like both my, NICE and MHRA to be allowed to raise much more revenue from international consultancy and to digitalize their protocols and sell them internationally. So th there's, my, th there's my three points and one overarching one, Eleanor. Great, thanks, George. And actually, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to you about the kind of process efficiency side of things. Um, Jean, maybe on to you and your, your words of wisdom about um, post-Brexit regulation. Well, query words of wisdom. Um, and, and also as well, I, I very much want to acknowledge that I'm very much part of a team here in Birmingham um, with my colleagues, Laura Downey, Rachel Dixon, and um, Euron Quigley in terms of our contribution to the reform report here. But also my, uh, some of my reflections on Brexit also are influenced by work we've done with UK and Changing Europe. Uh, and as part of another project we finished last year with my colleagues, um, Tamara Harvey at the University of Sheffield and Mark Fleer uh, at Queen's Belfast. So I'm, I'm very much only, only one part of a, a, a team for, really for these purposes too. Um, we're in a, a time of, of change uh, and a considerable time also of turmoil. And I think in many ways it's, it's quite interesting when we look at where we are now in our reactive response to the uh, debates around Brexit as compared with how we were say 12 months ago. We are dealing with what are, of course, fundamental questions of, of regulation at the same time as we're dealing with uh, an international crisis in relation to COVID. And this perhaps, I think, raises the questions of how and what we can do in the short term and the long term about this in terms of how we structure and take forward regulation and innovation realistically. Things are moving apace, of course, and as Eleanor's rightly absolutely said, you know, today the Medicines and Devices Bill is there, it's second reading in the House of Lords itself. A lot is going on at the moment, but also we're in a situation where we need to think about how we can effectively regulate, how we can effectively regulate too in terms where we still don't precisely know where we're going to be in terms of Brexit, in terms of whether we get a deal or no deal. In, in the second fourth iteration of that that we've had over the last year um, in, in terms of the various mm, agreements that mm. are being looked at at the moment. And the uncertainties around that. We've also got as well the major concerns around recognising innovation, but at the same time, realising that this has to be built on a foundation of patient safety. And this is something which, of course, goes right the way through concerns of regulation in, in pharmaceuticals going back from the days of thalidomide onwards really uh, in terms of restructuring and, uh, and casting where the, the law and the regulation effectively should go to and we've seen that of course much more recently in the in the last few weeks in the Cumberland report coming out as well so this is an area where I think we have to be realistic about what we can do in the short term and how we engage with this where Proportionate, effective, safe regulation, I think, is, is particularly critical. And there's a danger of trying to move too fast, perhaps, too soon, at this particular time, given all the uncertainties. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and Emma, for introduction and words of wisdom. Thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation to be part of this event and, and the report, which, again, I agree with my colleagues here, is very timely. A very valuable opportunity for exchange. So um, I'm head of international regulatory policy at ABVI and that gives me an opportunity to advise my organization with a very global lens on some of the implications of the decisions that the UK are taking now as we move forward. The UK has always been a very pragmatic leading a voice in the European regulatory system for medicines and medical devices. And, and I think it's important that we maintain that strength of voice on the international stage. 
Um, AbbVie have recognized and valued the relationship highly with the EU, but now again, recognizing and picking up on what George said, we have to move forward and realize there'll be a new partnership and a new opportunity to think about where can we align and where can we take new decisions, new frameworks, new challenging opportunities to really continue to be that leading voice globally and internationally. And that's really where I'd like to focus um, for my remarks here as we move forward. Uh, and I know you mentioned a series of guidances that were published just yesterday. I think it's important to note that these are only a small part of the information that we need. When you look across those guidances, they're a great start. Um, they start to give us a feel for the framework, but there's a number of areas there where guidance is yet to be published. Um, and I think that will come up in our discussion this afternoon is where else are those remaining difficult questions? Perhaps the guidance tackles the easy things. Um, it's the difficult, uh, knotty problems that we're waiting on guidance and final positions. But we really want to look to the future, but you can't ignore the guidance that's put down now for this transitional period as we move beyond the EU regulatory system to our own standalone position lay the groundwork for the future. They will ripple and they will shape the environment on which we will build our future regulation. So as we go into this discussion, I really want to make sure there's not unintended consequences from the decisions that are taken now as we transition in order to build that robust framework for ensuring patient safety in the future, but also encouraging that innovation bringing that leading voice and creating the wonderful ecosystem in the UK, evidence generation and pull through of R&D to medicines that actually reach patients. Thank you. Great, Emma, thank you very much. Um, so actually now we're gonna start digging in a, in a bit deeper about those kind of uh, regulatory challenges that, that the UK um, faces and actually, um, I was thinking that we could uh, potentially ask uh, attendees for their opinion right before I ask that question to, to Jean. So I will launch a second little poll. Um, so again, this is obviously not an exhaustive list of, of all of the possibilities, but I'm just launching it now. So the question to you is, what are the main challenges in the current regulatory landscape? So one option is not enough emphasis on patient safety. Um, Another one is the process from kind of idea generation through to market launch is potentially a bit too slow. Um, there, the process might not be particularly efficient. Um, and one of the examples here that is shown is kind of contradicting guidance and the kind of general um, challenge of regulation lags behind innovation. Um, so that you should see a, a kind of little pop-up box uh, pop on your screen. Um, so please cast your vote. You can actually choose uh, multiple choices this time. Um, if so you don't have to just pick a single one. Um, there are about 52% of votes that came in. I'm just going to wait for to reach about maybe what 65 or 70 before stopping it and asking you that question um, directly. Okay, almost there. Okay, we're now at about 70%. Um, actually over 70%. So I will end the poll um, now and just um, kind of use this as a kind of backdrop to um, the discussion and the question that we will be looking at right now. So really, it kind of seems the majority of you think that really it is regulation that lags behind innovation, which is one of the kind of main challenges of the current regulatory landscape. Um, and second to that would be that the process is actually too slow. Okay, so I will now um, stop sharing uh, these results with you. And Jean, if I could potentially go to you to um, kind of ask you to answer that question of what do you foresee as the kind of main regulatory challenge is that the UK faces and potentially specifically highlight some of the issues that you see around patient safety, as I know that that was the topic of, of um, obviously the, the piece that you wrote in today's publication. Yes, so the key challenge is are, relate again fundamentally, I think, to that lack of certainty. Um, we still are not clear absolutely where the negotiations over Brexit absolutely will end up. We know that, I mean, in, certainly in terms of the intention of the government in relation to the future relationship between the UK and the EU, the idea of facilitating trade in medicinal products and supporting high levels of patient safety is written in there, along with the idea of commitments 
in terms of a whole range of issues. Now, of course, it takes two to tango in terms of the negotiations and where one actually goes on this. Where we are in terms of what's come out again over the last you know, 24 hours or so uh, is very much putting us back in a way where we were about a year ago, because of course the NRHA were planning in the context of the no deal Brexit and you know, draft regulations have been put through to deal with the situation of you know, how we would deal with products, et cetera, and so on up until that time. So considerable planning was undertaken. And then of course they didn't need that at that point. We're now moving on to this stage. And this stage is also reflected by as well the fact that we've got primary legislation ultimately going through at the moment. So really what, uh, and as Emma's also pointed out, what we've got here essentially is the guidance documents. These are going to be intended to reflect it with regulations themselves enacted on the back of the medicines bill itself. But this also depends upon considerable consultation exercises undertaken about them as well and where they actually get to. All of which will have to be done in a reasonably expedited period of time as well. So in terms of the initial challenges, the initial challenges are, are say, well, what can we actually get in place before the end of transition to mean that the wheels don't fall off the bars, essentially? Um, uh, and so that the you know, effective you know, trade can be continued, effective regulation can be continued in that time. So you, in effect, you've got, I think, the immediate challenge period question. You've then got the second issue, which is where you want things to go longer term which then links into both what George is saying and also in terms of Emma saying. And that is a visionary question really of where you think actually things should be um, actually put at. And this also links to the question of whether in terms of the EU law in this area, whether and to what extent there will be agreements. And that's what, because of course, one, well, first of all, whether in terms of vision, whether we intend to depart entirely Mm. It's the line, effectively, rather than the line with what's there. Whether we want to, or align in the short term, but not in the long term around this, these things. Even in terms of short term alignment, what we can do with that depends, to at least some extent, on questions of reciprocity with the EU. Mm. Because it depends on our ability to access EU systems. To access, so, for example, we can the MRHA itself said before they were intending to have their own pharmacovigilance system. But without agreements, we can't access the EU pharmacovigilance systems. There's various forms of EU law coming down the line. We know that there's intending to be alignment, and that came out in the documents of the last 24 hours, um, with the law in terms of Northern Ireland, uh, in consistent with the Northern Ireland Protocol, say in terms of things like devices. Um, so there will be a degrees of divergence or potentially or could be or might not be or, or might not be depending on where it all goes. Um, but so that those will have to be you know, looked at as well. Yeah. But full alignment will depend upon access. Full alignment again, the clinical trials regulation and its implementation is that. If we go down that line, that again depends on access to again the EU databases, the EU systems. We can't do that without agreement. So we can align if you want to and have continuity. But that only that we can only do so much ourselves. So as I said, short term, what do we do to try and ensure this continuity? Longer term, where we actually want to go, and particularly then how that does relate to the patient safety agenda. Uh, yeah. Doesn't mean that EU law in itself in the past has been absolutely perfect. We've seen in, in terms of devices problems. Uh, we've seen it from you know the PIP breast implant scandals. We've seen controversy over you know, the, again, metal hip uh, implants and so on more recently. And of course, we've seen the Cumberland report, the major concerns about regulation in this area. Um, so potentially, for example, an enhanced role could be given to the MRHA. Mm. The, some of the things that were rejected when the proposals for the reform of the Medicines Devices Directive, which would have given a bigger role to the European Medicines Agency, for example, and aligned procedures much more with that in relation to medicines. So again, you know, those are the sorts of things that can be done. But in essentially, really, the challenges are one, what on earth is actually going to happen, really? Uh, two, what can we really cope with, given there's only so much my, you know, space available in government mm. to develop things, given what we're dealing with the pandemic in the short term, and then giving us space in the long term 
to effectively engage and have those discussions. Thank you, Jean. And actually, related to this is a really interesting question uh, from the audience, which I'm, I'm, I'm going to grill you with, George, if possible. Um, so it states that basically kind of Switzerland has a, a massive trade surplus uh, in medical devices and see their kind of sector generally terrified by being treated as outside of the EU uh, with kind of new new regulations. And opposite to that, uh, the UK has a large tra trade deficit in the kind of medical devices fields, but seems to want to kind of move further away from converging with, with the EU. And so the question is really, is moving away from that convergence a kind of good long-term strategy? Um, and, and does that really kind of showcase thought leadership? And I guess given your, the kind of things that you mentioned in, in your introductory speech, I was just wondering, what, what do you think of this? Do you think actually con not converging can be a very good long-term strategy? Yeah, well, firstly, I'd just say I, I agree with, um, uh, you know, everything that's just been said, the, the urgency right now is to avoid a cliff edge and problems in January. Uh, and that should rightly be the priority. Um, the, the point I was trying to make really, I think, is about that ultimately, I think Brexit um, turbocharges the, the challenge we already faced, which is that given we have a, an NHS procurement system, which means we are never going to be paying the highest prices. And we tend to be, have tended to be a low and slow price payer. So low price and slow payer. That is, that makes us a pretty unattractive market for uh, pharma to launch medicines in. So we better have a very compelling USP so that people across the boardrooms of global industry say, um, why are we going to the UK? They're, they pay really slow and they pay really low. Uh, the answer being, I think, uh, my suggestion is the compelling answer would be, yeah, but you've got to have a look at what they're doing with the NHS genomics program, the NHS informatics program, and they're decentralizing and creating genuinely patient empowered disease and place based digital accelerated access communities. So you can now get into 10 million patients in the UK going through Manchester, Birmingham, Oxfordshire, London, Cambridge, those uh, accelerated access hubs you can get access quickly to clinicians, tissues, patients uh, in a well-regulated way, but in a more flexible and fleet of foot way. And I think unless we have a, a really compelling USP longer term, I fear we will lose influence. We'll have fewer and fewer clinical trials being done in the UK, fewer and fewer companies coming to the UK, and um, we'll be trying to maintain our influence through the MHRA's international reputation in Europe, but will become effectively less relevant. And I, I think to compensate for that, um, as well as continuity in January, we've got to have a strong vision and a strong strategy for how we compete. And I think if we do that, we could actually continue to hold a position of intellectual leadership. We're already highly regarded within European regulatory circles, huge respect for the MHRA and for UK medicine. And I think with a strong framework, a strong regulatory framework, basically the UK saying we intend to write the playbook for 21st century genomic and phenotypically targeted medicines. I think we could become a gateway into the European market, the place that industry goes first on their way into Europe. And I fear if we don't have something compelling like that, they won't come to us at all. Right. And in terms of, I guess, process efficiency where where would you see the kind of opportunities lie to kind of potentially streamline the regulatory process so that it's also made easier when people come to innovate here uh well i think it i think one has to think about the the different bits of the market so um on drugs on devices on digital um i think on digital we we're way behind the curve and that's in a way the easiest place to make but really quick um, improvements. We're, we're basically still running a national health service on, um, well, we're still really running it on paper and cardboard with digital bits. And um, th that just isn't acceptable. We, we, we have to create properly digitally integrated systems. And I, I would, uh, I'm just skeptical that tipping more and more money into the top of NHS England and DHS is going to achieve that. I would seek to build um, digital disease uh, pyramids, if you like, um, 
and place-based digital communities. And pretty soon, I think you'd have 80% of the UK on digital platforms, and then you could mop up the rest. Um, so I, I think on devices, actually, the, uh, the European system um, traditionally hasn't worked badly, actually. And I think we should be quite decentralized about allowing clinicians with particular disease expertise to innovate. And I think on uh, drugs, you know, the, the key is to look at the pipelines of the drug companies over the next 20 years and look at what's coming down the line. And uh, if we're not careful, we're going to see more and more drugs coming that have much more targeted patient groups, much narrower reimbursement um, uh, populations. And we're going to fall foul. We're just going to end up with nice saying no to everything. And um, unless we are more creative in saying, look, we'll give you accelerated access into a, an ethically approved regulatory structured patient cohort. And with us, you can work out the value of your medicine, the real value. And we'll look at putting together a novel reimbursement package for you. I think we could be very innovative with the freedom of being outside the EU. And I, I, I think if we're not, there's a danger that we become a backwater. Um, now, I'm not saying it's easy. Um, that's why I preferred us to reform the EU from within. But that not being possible, I think the, the challenge is we're going to have to be quite bold. And I think decentralization, digitalization, patient empowerment, stronger voice for the charities, we could end up genuinely writing the playbook of 21st century regulation. Thanks. Thanks, George, for that message of hope. <laughs> Emma, could I potentially ask you, obviously, I, I won't put you on the spot and ask you to summarise the 31 documents that came out yesterday, um, but do you feel that there is potentially now um, slightly greater clarity or, as you kind of mentioned, uh, obviously, in, in your kind of introductory remarks, that there is potentially still uh, some challenges that, that kind of need to be addressed and maybe it's the kind of easy things that have been answered now? And I guess what do you see as the as a kind of main gaps or major difficulties or things that we kind of still need to tackle. Thank you. And as I said already, I do think that the, the guidance that's come out is welcome and, and that's great, but it is very much, I think, bringing forward the, the preparations, as Jean said, that were done um, a year or so ago by MHRA to help us transition and keep the wheels on um, and make sure we are actually able to continue to have medicines flow and be available you know, in the UK. But it is important to think about the foundations for the future as just laid out. And when we think about how medicines are developed globally, you know, there are international globally agreed standards for how good clinical practices run, how science um, and endpoints are set um, in organizations like the ICH and others. So where there's global standards, the UK stay part of that conversation and drive to help shape that future environment. But it's important to recognize we shouldn't be deviating from those global standards that drive the way medicines are developed. You then come down to the regulation itself. And that's where we have to walk that fine line between staying aligned enough to benefit from the partnerships and the relationships we have with European regulators or other regulators around the world, but then still keep a focus on what is that USP for the UK? What is that point that really drives global companies to think it's worthwhile taking the risk of bringing your great innovation to the UK first? Because it is a risk. Wherever you go first, you're going to learn more about the product and you're going to have an opinion, a regulator's assessment around that. Um, and traditionally, you'd go for the largest market and think about where can you get that powerful, strong science opinion that will then have others that follow. And we tend, as global organizations, to go to FDA and, and EMA first. So why would we come to the UK? Well, then let's think about that regulation around evidence generation how you can genuinely get that access to insights for your product that show the value that you can bring. And then the evidence you generate in the UK is usable around the world to support your global filings and your global uh, launches and markets. So that's where I think we need to go. So back to your specific question, with the guidance that's coming out of MHRA, as I said, it's focused on the transition and ensuring we do facilitate patient access and keep things moving but it is setting a baseline from which we will need to move for the future. 
Um, we haven't yet talked much about Northern Ireland, but with Northern Ireland continuing to comply and align with the European pharmaceutical key, the, the regulations for Europe, um, it will be important to think about what that means for Northern Ireland patients and GB patients in ensuring that all can continue access to great innovation. So the guidance to come, um, I think, is very, very important around clinical trials, movement of investigational products, ensuring we can drive research in the UK and not put unnecessary administrative barriers in place. Thank you, Emma. And actually, I know that this is not kind of regulation per se, but, but a kind of very important element when thinking about the kind of commer commercialization pipeline, um, which is also very important to, to be able to kind of access drugs um, and devices is kind of looking at the, the cost effectiveness of treatment. And obviously, as, as kind of mentioned earlier, right now, NICE is doing a review of their health uh, technology assessment method. So what do you really see as the kind of main opportunities uh, to improve this process? So maybe, Jean, if I could go to you first on, on this question, maybe I'll ask Emma if she has any kind of further comments to, to add. Hmm. Yeah, it's not my uh, self health technology assessment is not my, yeah. my, my main area. So you might, I think you're better off asking Emma. No problem. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Very no, sorry. No, it's fine. Emma. Um, well, maybe, maybe I'll make a few comments and Jean, see if I can get your reaction to those and if they make sense to you. So I think one of the things that's really important to think about is many of the steps that go from when we develop a medicine to actually being in the hands of healthcare professionals and then with patients are sequential at the moment. One follows the other. And I think we need to look more at how can this be a holistic process that ensures that we have a thorough evaluation of the safety and effectiveness and quality of a medicine and really understand where the value comes for patient populations and mitigating and managing any risk as a holistic view. So with the accelerated access processes and reviews with EAMS and the other processes that are in place, we need to build on that and actually make sure that we bring together the expectations, the evidence requirements from the MHRA with those from NICE, with those from the NHS and for healthcare professionals. And think of that as one evidence package that really allows that flexibility and that agility to come through. Because at the moment we go through a stepwise fashion and you go through one set of stakeholders and then you start with the next. Um, and that really delays that access. And that's what brings that slow pace to access for UK patients. So for me, one of the things that the NICE methodology review can bring is to really make sure that we think about holistically what actually do we need to demonstrate to bring that safe, effective, value-added product into the healthcare system in the UK. Great, thank you, Emma. I don't know if George or Jean, you wanted to kind of react, react to that maybe. I can see George nodding, so I will go to you. Yeah, thank you. I um, completely agree with uh, what Emma just said. Um, and I, I'd make another point, which is that you know, in, in this new landscape where the, the central change is that one size is, um, you know, less and less fitting all. We're going to see more and more medicines that are, um, that work in a much more powerful way for a more stratified population. And I, I'd like um, us to be quite bold and accept that NICE was actually set up really, if we're honest, to protect ministers from difficult decisions about the affordability of drugs. So um, we set up NICE to give us advice and say, that is very, very expensive and we don't think it's cost benefit, clinical benefit worth it. And then we'd say we're very reluctant, but we're always guided by NICE. And I want to suggest that actually the reforms where the NHS is now running its own budget and is independently run, create an opportunity. And I, I'd like NICE to be given the freedom to become much more of a, you know, less the kind of, um, the NHS's front door that reluctantly explains why things are too expensive. The NHS is capable of making that decision for itself and in fact is, the, is making it for itself. Um, I'd like NICE to be a much more international leadership body again in health economics and to have a series of pathways. Um, one might be uh, we look, we've looked at this drug and we can't see how on earth it could save anyone any, any money. No, we've looked at this drug, we think it could potentially but it'll need big reform of the patient pathway. We recommend that it is taken through and used in a patient cohort. 
um, on a conditional approval basis with review points. And then let's see what the full cost of the patient pathway changes and net net um, uh, demonstrate the value. P pathway three might be, uh, we think it could have real value, but probably not until it's been in use for two or three years. And we suggest a payment by results model. Um, you know, payment four might be, it's an incredibly powerful drug. It's not very good for the NHS because we haven't got big enough budgets to afford it, but other healthcare systems might well have more money. You, so that we, we, we allow NICE to fly again as a really international health economics leadership group. We don't compromise them by making them be the body that says no, no, because the NHS can't afford it. And I think it would also open up the debate about NHS affordability of medicines, which is one that we ought to be having anyway. So um, I, I'd like to be quite, I mean, I'm no longer a member of the government and, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not shaping policy, but I, I'd like to give NICE a chance to be more of a world leader again and let the NHS take more responsibility for the clinical decisions that it takes about its priorities and the, the political conversation in the UK about whether we're, we're rationing drugs too heavily, which is a conversation we ought to be having, but it's mm. not one that we should be compromising NICE by making them own on our behalf. Great, George, thank you very much. Um, so we will now be kind of moving on to the Q&A from the audience and we have many questions that have come through. Um, and just as, as, a, as a kind of word, if possible, to attendees, if we could avoid questions that are too complicated, because I can see a few with whether uh, the kind of guess, I guess typical, typical standards language with um, quite hard to follow acronyms of CTR 536 slash 2014. Um, which you know, I will I will try and 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 kind of ask these uh, to to, to um, our panelists. But anyway, to kind of group, of, we have a couple of questions here together on um, actually the potential to um, promote a regulatory standard in a that would sorry a, a regulatory standard post market surveillance regulatory standard that would potentially promote a teensy bit more of open sharing around um, incidents and kind of post-market surveillance. So a couple of attendees here have remarked that obviously the current regulatory system doesn't uh, particularly promote kind of open sharing of incident data beyond the kind of manufacturer's um, requirements. So, you know, is there a potential um, actually uh, in kind of incentivizing companies uh, to do so um, in a kind of more open way. And there is also a question about um, access to uh, the uh, clinical trials registries and the Udemed database for post-market surveillance um, of medical devices, um, which obviously is an important part of, of, of ensuring patient um, safety. Um, so I was wondering, Jean, do you have, I guess, kind of any responses to, to those questions? Okay, so um, if we take first, so going back really in a sense, in terms of access to databases, then those are issues that will be subject to negotiation mm -hmm. um, because automatic access to those is as part of our membership of the EU. So that if we are going to be actually participating fully in those, uh, and the same with the new clinical trials database coming on stream, for which all clinical trials under the regulation have to be entered into the database, um, then that again is, is, is going to be subject to negotiations. Um, generally otherwise in terms, I mean, the, the prospect of mutual recognition agreements, for example, being uh, negotiated are, are indeed out there. Um, but again, it all really depends on what actually happens with the, the negotiations themselves. The other point about sharing information I do think is important. Um, that raises really the question of how one squares commercial, again, we're back to squaring commercial considerations with, with broader patient safety questions, um, because you're dealing with issues that are, are sensitive, but also, and, and generally also questions of the public good, because one can say that this is a matter for responsible business, who one would think would be themselves interested in participating in schemes would enable information to be made available mm. as well. And there is that point about, as I said, how you go from protecting one's commercial interests to recognising the broader public good in that situation in, in terms of, of the way in which you view your own corporate systems. Mm. That's really interesting. Um, I, I was wondering, Emma, maybe do you have, a, I guess, a kind of view on, on that um, 
I guess, tension between, I guess, what is maybe commercially sensitive and what can actually be more openly shared from a kind of pharmaceuticals uh, perspective? I think it's important to, you know, baseline here that all information that we learn about our medicines is shared with the regulators. So mm -hmm. all safety information is automatically shared and immediately with, with regulators as, as it becomes available. Um, so it's not that there isn't that full sharing and openness. And so I think it's about sharing um, and ensuring that there is a good understanding of the benefit risk profile of every product that that is well then communicated to healthcare professionals and to patients and i think in the communication of uh, new safety information there's a lot of uh, improvements that we could make um, in thinking about how that is uh, understood taking some often very complex scientific you know language and ensuring that that is really clear and well understood by patients and i definitely think that there's some really interesting areas we could work on there but when we talk about the databases and the sharing of information, um, Jean made the point earlier, you know, that isn't in our gift in the UK. Um, you know, there are European databases and there will have to be an agreement that, um, you know, on both sides, that the sharing of that information is the right way forward. Um, I think if you look at it through the lens of in the interest of patient safety, why would you not share those databases? But there are many other layers of factors that are likely to go into that decision. And I think whatever arrangements are in place at the end of this year is a starting point. Rebuilding relationships between the UK and the EU. Um, and I think things like mutual recognition agreements, which ABVI would fully support around manufacturing, testing and release, sharing of information on a safety basis. There are many ways that can be um, continued beyond a trade deal. Um, recognition and collaboration agreements between regulators around the world are agreed all the time um, and they're not done under the banner of a trade agreement. So I think continuing to have good sharing of information between regulators globally and internationally, ensuring that that is well understood and communicated and translated to healthcare professionals and patients is something um, that I think we would all be supporting. I also just come back on also the sharing information because that's something Cumberland picked up and raised questions over some research, you know, funded by manufacturers that never saw the light of day because, for example, it was inconclusive or negative or other things even less than transparent. So concerns about conflicts of interest there is, is slap bang in there in the Cumberland report. Um, and also too, there have been concerns in the past, again, about the use of the yellow card scheme. And again, some parts of Europe being better and some other things better in terms of how that's been implemented. So it may depend on context, perhaps, and not saying all of those issues, perhaps on some of them. Right. Thanks. Um, so actually, a question about SMEs here, because obviously it's very important to the kind of innovation landscape that we that we create a, I guess, a um, an environment that that does foster innovation from all types of players. Um, so maybe a question for you, George. Um, obviously SMEs, I guess, already struggle to navigate the complexities of regulation and the kind of regulatory pipeline uh, for products uh, and, and devices in, in the UK. Um, how do you think they will cope with basically kind of going through two systems? And do you think that that will maybe encourage SMEs to just you know leave the UK and 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 not stay, or how how do, how do we make sure that we you know don't, don't disincentivize innovations from potentially smaller players that might have less resource to really kind of understand the complexities of the regulatory landscape? Mm. Well, it's a great question. Uh, the the SME, the health of our SME sector is hugely important for the UK economy, far more than for uh, most of the other European countries. The life science sector is hugely significant for us. And um, I, I actually disagree with a bit of your, the premise of your question. I don't think uh, for most SMEs, the regulatory framework complexity is the biggest problem they face at all. Actually, I think it's, my experience is it's been pretty straightforward, pretty clear. It doesn't make it easy, but it shouldn't be easy, but it, it is not the biggest problem. Far the bigger problem for an SME in the UK is procurement, is getting anybody in the NHS um, to be able to place a purchase order. And there are, I mean, I could bore for Britain. I, I mean, I will one day, you know, 
on um, how many examples of brilliant innovation in the UK, um, not just drugs, but uh, right down to, you know, brilliant ideas from nurses for reducing ulcers and, and hot innovations that have come out of the system, that there is uh, very little mechanism traditionally for a, an individual hospital or a group of hospitals to be able to place a purchase order. And one of the, one of the problems actually of the kind of um, uh, centralization of procurement for efficiencies is that that's got harder. Uh, if you're a clinical director or a procurement director in a hospital, um, the imposition now of very heavy centralized purchasing makes it even harder to do that. That's the really big issue I think facing SMEs and um, that's why I, I, I make the case that I do that we should try and create three, four, five hubs for accelerated access, which are led by strong clinical leadership in those uh, patient communities um, that are able to make enlightened, to make their own decisions about procurement and um, drive more innovation into the procurement system. And actually for many SMEs, um, the, the more important um, moment of validation isn't um, money, it's data. Um, for most SMEs, being able to say to your investors, um, hey, I've got a purchase order from uh, Birmingham or London or Greater Manchester, they're not paying for the bandages or for the device or for the drug, but we're gonna get the data that shows that it works. Um, the fact that you've been taken seriously by NHS clinicians and you've got a purchase order to actually prove that it works, that's the far bigger value inflection point for an SME. You can go and raise money off the back of that. So actually, it's not about money. It's about freedom to test and to procure. And I, I think it's really important that our post-Brexit regulatory landscape recognizes that as well, that, of course, patient safety is key, fundamental, mustn't be compromised. But that doesn't necessarily always mean you have to have one rule fits all from London. You know, clinicians in the end own their patient relationship and that's as it should be and I think it's not unhealthy for us to have say Manchester, Birmingham, Oxford, London, Cambridge sort of real hubs of research medicine able to do some innovation and some procurement themselves subject to some really important patient safety rules. I'm a believer in diversity. I think diversity would drive uh, innovation better than a centralized model. Mm -hmm. Actually, sorry, I muted myself. We, we have a question from the audience actually about how potentially um, data could be used as, as part of that kind of you know, long term uh, UK USP of understanding of how you could potentially provide um, high quality data sets as, as an international um, standard for regulation. Do, do you think, Emma, that that's something that would attract potentially companies to, to come to the UK if, if there was a, a bit more of ease of access to either be able to kind of validate um, you know, um, uh, devices or if it was to, to be able to, I don't know, explore new drug compounds or do you think that that could be part of a, of a long-term USP strategy? I definitely think that's the space that we need to focus on. Um, it is about generating evidence that's relevant for the world in the UK. So being able to you know, really drive agile research, getting studies up and running very quickly, um, having that access, taking away the multiple rounds of administration of getting through the system in order just to get you know, the product or the device in the hands of the clinicians who can really then give you the feedback and learn how best to use them, what's the best patient populations, where are the, paper, the, the populations that you know, it's not suitable for as well, so that we can really refine the use. And that that you know, is evidence generated to global international standards that then makes it very useful for an organization, whether they be an SME or a large global international company, to really build their evidence package and, and take that to the rest of the world. That's definitely something I think we should offer. And, Perhaps, you know, as we're coming, I know, towards the end of our time today, really focusing on the patient journey and really understanding what actually makes a patient's life better. And that's something you can get some fantastic insights on through that type of agile approach, to putting new innovations in the hands of clinicians, really allowing the experts to 
use those, talk with patients, really understand where they see the value, how does it improve their life, how does it improve their outcomes, not just in lab values, but in the reality of the way they live their lives. And I think if we can focus on that, everything else will follow. Emma, thank you very much. And, and uh, you are right, we are reaching the, the uh, end of, of, uh, of this event. Um, so maybe if I could go just one last time around uh, the panelists, 20 seconds response to, you know, if there's one thing that you could do in terms of regulation or even cost effectiveness studies of, of drug and devices that would help cement the UK um, as a world leader in life sciences, what would that be? And George, 10 seconds, 20 seconds response. Brexit's disruptive. We need continuity short term. We've got to have a str clear strategic longer term vision for a USP. And I would be looking for decentralized patient driven hubs of accelerated access with strong digital um, integration. So we generate the data on real patient journeys and that, that will give us, give us a global USP. Great, George. Thank you very much. Jean? We need clarity. And I think George is, <clears throat> and that is absolutely right. And and we need it sooner rather than later, both uh, at least for the short term as well. I think going forward, the questions well of the patient voice in terms of ongoing questions of regulation is so, so important that mm. we can look at it and we've looked at things from, uh, and indeed understandably in terms of competitiveness questions as well, the economy and everything else, but to ensure that, that patients themselves are integral in to us taking forward new regulatory models in the future and having proper discourses and full engagement as we go forward and structure that. Great, Jean, thank you very much. And Emma, for you, last 10 seconds. Thank you. Um, I think it's about invest in the life science sector, make it a really attractive place to come and do your research. And in order to have a robust, you know, vibrant uh, life science industry in the UK, invest in the regulator. A strong regulator is a really valuable element of a robust R&D system. Um, and if we get that journey right, understanding, um, I think that strong regulator, invest in the life science sector, and uh, that will be you know, the key to success. Great, Emma, thank you very much. And thank you again to all of our panelists, to our attendees, and thank you again to Abvi for supporting um, this event. I know that many of you have asked plenty of questions that we didn't have time uh, to address, but I'm unfortunately due to um, time constraints, I'm gonna have to bring this event to a close. Um, so just one very brief reminder uh, from me is that the video of this event will be shortly made available um, on our YouTube channel and our website. Um, and you should also all be receiving an updated version of the Reformer Thoughts with our very pretty infographic uh, summarizing currently what we know about the post-Brexit uh, regulatory process that we have had to update given uh, recent uh, events. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and I will now bring the event to a close. Thank you.